This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York. Juan Gonzalez is sheltering at home in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, after months of denial, President Donald Trump made his second-ever public appearance wearing a mask in North Carolina Monday, where he said a coronavirus vaccine could be available by the end of the year. He made the comments while touring a Fuji film plant that has been repurposed to make vaccines. And we're here, actually, today to discuss the exciting progress that we've achieved under the Operation Warp Speed, our historic initiative to develop, test, manufacture and deliver a vaccine in record time. And that's what it is, in record time. Likewise, therapeutically, we are very, very advanced. You're hearing about it, and you'll be hearing about it a lot more in the next two weeks. President Trump did not wear a mask during his news conference, and overnight he tweeted to his more than 80 million followers, I know you people want to talk about a mask. Hello, you don't need a mask. Well, the first major COVID-19 vaccine study launched in the U.S. Monday. In a collaboration between the drug maker Moderna and the National Institutes of Health, 30,000 people join a clinic trial this summer to a clinical trial this summer to determine the vaccine's safety and effectiveness. Top expert and the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci, said results from the late-stage study could be available as early as November. The company Pfizer also launched a late-stage study Monday that will involve 30,000 people from the United States, Argentina, Brazil and Germany. This all comes as a vaccine being developed by Oxford University has triggered an immune response. For more, we go to London, where we're joined by a science journalist who participated in Oxford's vaccine trial. Richard Fisher is a senior journalist at BBC Future. He wrote about his experience in a piece headlined, Coronavirus, What I Learned in Oxford's Vaccine Trial. Richard Fisher, welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about why you decided that you would be injected. Hi there. Hi, thanks for having me on. Um, so, for me, it was uh, both a, a personal decision and a, and a journalistic one. So. Um, I um, wanted to do something that um, uh, you know helps the collective effort to to get us closer to a vaccine. I mean, I've been relatively fortunate um, in this this pandemic in the sense that I'm not a frontline worker. I don't work in a shop or in a hospital or, or drive a bus. I'm a, I'm a journalist who works behind a desk working at home. So my my level of risk is is very low uh, compared with many others. And so I just saw an opportunity to kind of like help a, a study that I. Um, admired for the for the pace and speed at which it's moving along, and um, the second reason is is a kind of j j j journalistic curiosity one. Um, I report and write about clinical trials and and uh, and how science works from the outside, but I've never actually been part of one. And so, in in a kind of like method journalism kind of way, it was a, it was a great opportunity to actually see what it's like inside a, a clinical trial and what the process is like for the individuals who do volunteer. And could you take us through some of the uh, of the process uh, once you started the trial? Because this is an unusual situation where even before the, the trials are, are fully completed, we're finding uh, countries like Brazil this week announced that they're putting down $287 million for uh, initial doses uh, of the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, the, I mean, natural experience is is uh, with with the Oxford trial has been has been excellent so far. I mean, they the, the way the way it works is, is you, you sign up on the website, fill out um, a form, a questionnaire asking you about your medical history, and then from there you go to an initial screening appointment. And uh, in my case, it was in a the hospital um, in Tooting, South London, where my daughter was born. You know, I, I, I'd been there many times. And uh, it was a repurposed neurology ward that had been kind of like set aside for the the, the vaccine trials. And it was it was a I mean the hospital business hospital at the moment is is a um, is certainly different to when you go to see the daughter, the birth of your child. Um, it's uh, everyone's wearing masks, the strong smell of bleach everywhere. Um, but once in the, to the um, the the vaccine trial, they they talk you through. They want to. They want to inform you. Make sure that you know everything about the trial. So they, they explain the science to you. They explain the possible side effects. They also talk a bit about what what you won't be able to do, what you will be able to do. Um, you know, for example, you, I can't give blood for the next year. 
Um, if uh, if I was a woman, I would I would be asked to, to use contraception. And um, so so they're, they're very careful to make sure that you have full knowledge of everything that is going on within the trial and the potential side effects, uh, mild and severe, that you may or may not experience. And um, so it's it's a very thorough process at the start. Um, but then the following week, in my case, I went along and um, I had the, the the vaccine. Well. I, I should say I didn't have. I don't know whether I, I actually have the experimental vaccine. It's a 50/50 chance. So that in the Oxford trial, there's there's 10,000 of us, and we're split into two groups, and half will get the experimental vaccine being developed at Oxford University. The other half get a, a vaccine that's being developed for. Sorry, a vaccine that is already developed for meningitis and sepsis, and so. I don't know which vaccine I have, nor does the doctor who injects you either. And that, that's to make sure that the, the, the actual results of the trial are, are fully robust and in a double blind study. And, and how long was the process of the actual trial before the uh, preliminary results were announced? Ah, well, well I see. So, so this is, it's in various different phases. So the, the preliminary results were based on the initial thousand people who volunteered in an earlier phase of the trial. So. Um, a, a clinical trial, as, as many of your audience will know, move, moves through various different stages. The, uh, a, a vaccine is tested um, with, with animals uh, first, and, and the, the, the kind of the basic safety is, is understood. And then there's a small initial trial, and that's the results of which they, that was announced um, uh, the week, a week or two ago. That, that suggested very promisingly that um, there was no severe uh, safety problems, and also that there was an immune response generated in, in the bodies of the people that, that had the vaccine. So that, that's very promising. But what needs to be done now is, is expanding out into phase two, phase three, which is, is what's happening with the Moderna trial as well in the US at the moment. Um, this is about kind of testing safety and efficacy at scale. Um, in order to kind of have the confidence to deliver a vaccine to an entire country, to the entire world, to billions of people, you need to test over a, a large scale. You need a lot of people um, in a lot of different uh, kind of environments experiencing the, the uh, Different lives, the virus in different ways. Um, only then can you kind of like gain the confidence over time to to know whether a vaccine um, is both safe um, because, because it may, you may see very rare side effects in a, in a larger group of people, um, and then secondly, like uh, whether whether it actually works. So the, the, these, this is part of like science, like the long term, the long haul of developing a vaccine. I think it's, it's often kind of thought that you can just throw money, money at the problem and get a vaccine quicker. And it's, it's certainly true that like, we are accelerating vaccine development at the moment. Um, I mean, Operation Warp Speed is an example of that in the US. Um, but uh, there, there needs to be patience because um, it, only time will tell whether a, a vaccine works at scale. And this is something that's like is, is a challenge for the regulators. Um, at some point down the track with these vaccines rocketing through the trials, a regulator is going to have to say, yes, this is OK, we, we can roll this out. but um, a queue is going to instantly form of, of people who, who want this vaccine. Everybody in the world needs a vaccine at the moment. So there's huge political, social pressure on these scientists. I mean, it's, uh, it's a heavy burden to carry. I mean, it, it, I think it's fascinating from the point of view of the, the, the scientists. Um, many of them were working in different fields before this pandemic. You know, they were working on coronavirus vaccines, but not necessarily thinking about a pandemic of, of this scale. So. Now they have the expectation and hopes of billions of people around the world on their shoulders. So I have huge admiration for the scientists involved in this work. Richard Fisher, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, your thoughts on President Trump, you know, going to North Carolina last yesterday and before the big name of pushing for a vaccine, which is called Warp Speed, Operation Warp Speed, um, he talked about the various vaccine programs, but then last night tweeted, um, you don't need to wear a mask, as if going for a vaccine in the months to come means that, and as he said yesterday, um, states should be reopening, schools should be reopening for this promise in the future. Your brother's a, doc in a, doc a doctor in the uh, intensive care unit nearby where you are. Can you talk about the connection between these two things? And then if you could respond to a poll by Associated Press that found that half of Americans say um, that they would get a COVID-19 vaccine, but about 30 percent said they weren't sure, and another one in five said they would refuse to get a vaccine. Maybe part of their concern is that word warp speed. Is this going to be safe? There's a lot to unpack, but if you could. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, it's. I mean, that those statistics about people refusing a vaccine is it, 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 that is worrying because, um, you know, I, I think the the, the safety of, of these these vaccines is being tested in, in many many people, and I, I I would I would I would worry if people turn it down based on kind of minor side effects and, and concerns that they might have read on social media. I mean. If you're somebody who is unsure about having a vaccine, I would I just would suggest reading, reading go, going to authoritative sources, re, if, reading journalism from the BBC or magazines like New Scientist or Stat News based in Boston. I, I mean, th th this will tell you about like how the vaccines actually work and what what the process is. Um, the question of like the wearing masks. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I, I know this this has been hotly debated over here in the UK as well. I mean, it's only just been the case that masks are, have become compulsory inside shops, um, and there's there is, certainly is not the political question over here that it is in the US. Um, the science suggests that wearing a mask reduces your risk. It can't keep you safe. I mean, there's no such thing as being totally safe during a pandemic, but it's about reduction of risk. If something like reduces your risk just a little bit and also re reduces the risk of the people around you, then I think it's something that's worth doing. It's, it seems a very easy thing to do for me personally. I, you know, I don't mind wearing a mask. Um, the, as for the vaccine, I mean, it, it's, we're still a way off. I mean, it's, it's coming, but the typical timeline for vaccine development is, is, is measured in years, not, not months. I mean, I, I must admit, I was, I was surprised to hear Anthony Fauci suggest that the vaccine might, might come October and November. I mean, that's that's much faster than I expected, and, and he's more qualified than me to answer that question. But um, I think I think it's worth remembering we're in it for the long haul. I mean, the, the, this um, disease will be around for a long time. It, it's also the case that um, we shouldn't hold out hope that the first vaccine will be what's called a sterilizing vaccine. So many people think of a vaccine as, as something that it will just wipe out, and that's it, and and you can't you won't be able to get you, you won't catch the disease, but the some of the preliminary evidence suggests that that it may take more than one vaccine, um, and the first one might necessarily wipe out the disease. People may still be able to, for example, um, be protected, which would be fantastic. That would be of huge importance, but they could still pass it on, and that's something that that would still allow the disease to spread to those who haven't have it, or or those who cannot can't have a vaccine because they're vulnerable for other reasons. Um, for example, if they're, they're Twitter has or, removed a tweet that was retweeted by President Trump that falsely said there's a cure for coronavirus. He retweeted a tweet that said COVID has cure. America, wake up. But, uh, Richard Fisher, before we go, I wanted to ask you, you spent a year here with a Knight Fellowship um, looking at the problem of governments focused on short-termism. Can you make the connection between attitudes like these when it comes to coronavirus and denial of the climate crisis, for example? It's, it's definitely the case that um, there is in, in, embedded in the structure of, of like our political systems um, for any politician of, of, of any um, kind of party that the, the, the incentives are there to, to kind of please the, the base and the voters in the next election rather than make decisions that benefit um, society 5, 10, 15, even 50 years down the track. So, you know, it, it's, it's, this has been something that's been embedded within democracy um, for, for, for many years. So the, the question is, is more just how, how can we incentivize politicians to do things that, that benefit the next one? You know, so if, you, if a politician knows that their term is coming to an end, um, uh, why, why would they do something that they won't get the political credit for? And that, that's a challenge for, po for politics generally, I think. There, there are efforts to kind of think about that and think about like how our decisions um, and, and how our politicians um, make decisions that affect future generations, but it's a tough problem. Um, I think I think it's particularly acute at the moment with the rise of populist politics, um, because when you have politicians doing things that only speak to their base, um, then then that very much leads to short termism over like long the longer term benefit for society. Richard Fisher, I want to thank you for being with us, senior journalist at BBC Future, volunteer in the COVID-19 vaccine trial at Oxford University. We'll link to your piece, Coronavirus, What I Learned in Oxford's Vaccine Trial. In fact, Richard doesn't know if he got the vaccine or a placebo. But when we come back, we'll look at the government program pumping billions of dollars into vaccine development. Who's profiting? Stay with us.